Perfect. So thank you again, Dennis, and welcome to How to Be a High Bar Evaluator. Before we begin, I recommend taking notes. I apologize, I was going to bring paper and then I forgot, but I think the back of the agenda, the back of the agenda is blank to grace. Feel free to write on that, you know, those who are in person. And I encourage you to write down the advice that you like, things that are not answered, and anything you disagree with as well. And please bring your questions to the Q&A section at the end. I also want to acknowledge the people whose techniques and uh, practices in speech evaluation have informed the content of this workshop. Club founder Craig Wood and club members Wendy Nee and David Way have demonstrated or given me advice that I still use today. And Dennis, as you just heard from, and Renee Yao are accomplished Bay Area Toastmasters whose tips and workshop content are all over the presentation we are gonna hear. Uh, in addition, Dennis reviewed and advised on today's presentation. So thank you. But let's begin. I wanna ask, can any of you think of anywhere else in life that you get frequent, immediate, actionable feedback? Any company you work for, any team you've been on, or any relationship you've been in? Everyone, <laughs> they are the mirror of truth that you never know you, 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 you did not need. I will say, in my case, I couldn't think of any specific areas, but it did make me think maybe we should revisit these other areas of our lives as well. And I'll back to that thought later on in the workshop. So I am, I'm not exaggerating. I love Toastmasters evaluations. The fact that every Toastmasters meeting has evaluations of the prepared speeches and the meeting itself is one of the top practices that sold me on Toastmasters. Evaluations also suit my slightly judgmental nature. I happen to work in user experience design and interface design, which is a critique heavy field. Good design has a purpose behind everything that's there. Why did we use this word? Why is this that color? Why why is that misaligned by one pixel? So this this high bar mentality was also useful for Toastmasters evaluations. And as you heard earlier, I once placed third in the District 101 evaluation contest. I think it was because of evaluations that identified unique things that were done well, as well as unique improvements. I'm gonna say I know it wasn't my editing skills because I'm still working on those. But I'll also say that, oh, hold on. The one moment has me adjust this layout. Thanks. Yeah. I'll say after a while, I also saw was not always good at Toastmasters. Why were speakers coming in with underprepared speeches or speeches that didn't embrace the project goals? Why did speakers go through the projects without showing as much improvement as they wanted? I also noticed lightweight evaluations where even when the speakers were new or not yet advanced, the evaluators identified very little to improve on. And this meant that evaluations were inaccurate because they didn't point out the areas that needed improvement. At one club that I visited, not our club, the adjective amazing was used to describe average speeches in an average meeting with, to be honest, less than average evaluations. But the thing was, I was kind of part of the problem. <laughs> Did I tell that other club that they were misusing the word amazing? No, I felt kind of hesitant to tell them. As for us, we were doing okay, right? We had achieved President's Distinguished Club status four years in a row. And we're one of the largest clubs in District 101, which is about, which more than 140 clubs. But there's also some bad news. In 2022 to 2023, we gained 21 members and we lost 21 members. They're not the same 21 people. And, and Dennis, who had observed a couple of our meetings and met with the club officers, pointed out something I hadn't thought of before. He said, people join our club because we're nice and they leave our club because we're nice. Uh, they do their icebreaker, which is their first speech. They get a nice evaluation and then just kind of stops. 
They don't get to that second speech. They do not answer membership renewal emails, which is very annoying to me as VP of membership. But our club, and I'll say honestly, many Toastmasters clubs are failing to let their members know they could, they should do so much more and they can do so much more. As for me, this wake up call showed that I hadn't shared the techniques that were working for me. And all of this is why we're here today and we're, where we're gonna talk about how to give high bar evaluations that we will all love. So let's talk about the agenda. We'll spend about 15 minutes on how to find high bar feedback, 15 minutes on how to deliver constructive, efficient about high bar evaluations, five minutes on the benefits of evaluations, not just in Toastmasters, but outside, and then we'll end with 15 minutes for, for Q&A. All right, so part number one, how to find high bar feedback. There are three principles and practices to this for me. First, maintain loyalty to speaker progress. Use a note-taking template and being able to evaluate both advanced and beginner speakers and everybody who's in between. So firstly, thinking back to the number one thing that drives me, I have no loyalty except to the progress of my fellow Toastmasters. You should too. It's your job to judge the speech, but that's not the same as passing judgment on the person, which I think is something that often consciously or unconsciously results in a lightweight evaluation. But as we mentioned, the danger of a lightweight evaluation is it's inaccurate for the audience as well as the speaker. And when people see an evaluator that say middling speech is great, what audience members internalize is, I'm not sure Toastmasters has what I'm looking for. You know, I expected more. So don't let hurting people's feelings get in the way of being honest. It is hurting your fellow club members if you're not honest with them. So for an example, maybe your fellow club member went out on the limb and cried humor, which was especially impressive because English was their third language. But if it wasn't all that funny, if it wasn't all that effective, you have a responsibility to tell them that. I'll also share a tip that Renee Yao mentioned. When it comes to evaluating beginner speakers, it might help to imagine that you're speaking to a younger sibling or a mentee and think of how you would deliver the critical feedback in a way that could be received well. But regardless, no matter what, stay honest and stay loyal to speaker progress. The next step in being a high bar evaluator is using a note-taking template. I, I would say I wish I catch details and unique observations off the cuff, but a thorough template is actually what helps me do that. Currently, my template has three sections. There is the top section for capturing purpose and effectiveness, middle section of positives and areas of improvement, and the last section capturing any missing fundamentals. So nearly all the observations are captured in the middle section, which is simply one side for positives, things done well, and one side for deltas, the things needing improvement or change. I'm going to say this is the most important part of the template. So if you write down anything about templates, make sure it's this. And in here, there are three types of items that are written down. What I saw, what I heard, what I felt. These come from one of Dennis's workshops who shared with me that he got this template from yet another Toastmaster, Mike Daly. I, I also want to share, I recently tried an experiment where I wondered if I could improve on this. I thought maybe I would make maybe multiple granular sections instead of just the three. I thought it was going to be great. I was certain I would capture every aspect of the speech. And it was kind of a disaster. <laughs> it was very difficult to take notes that way because you never know when a certain aspect of a speech is going to happen. So it turns out I can confirm that these three buckets, what you see, what you hear, what you feel, they have the right amount of granularity for catching both delivery and effectiveness skills of the speech while also being flexible enough for note-taking. So another question that comes with note-taking is like, how do we know what to write down? The advice I got from club members, David and Wendy was basically, your gut knows when you hear something good and your gut knows when you hear something that could be better. So whenever you have one of those gut feelings, simply jot it down under the saw, heard, or felt section. And finally, our last thing I'll point out about these three sections is they're kind of a checklist. If you wrap up your notes and you notice any one of these whole rows is empty, think back on the speech. 
maybe you didn't feel anything because the speech was lacking a message or lacking emotional connection. So that might mean that the speaker needs to look at a rewrite of their speech, or maybe they need to work on emoting and connect with the audience. All right. And at the top of the template, I note the speech title because that's actually the start of the speech content. Opener, how did the speaker open the speech? How did they close the speech? What seemed to be the speech's purpose? And lastly, how did they try to achieve that purpose? And I'm gonna note, these are all very brief, like one sentence summaries of this that just cap quickly capture each item. For example, I might say like three related anecdotes built up to a call to action. That was the how of the speech. And the idea for this section came after watching an evaluation contest where our club founder, Craig, was the only contestant who pointed out that the test speaker's speech lacked a message or some kind of call to action. And I say the content and the rationale of the speech are, are very important. I figure most of us join Toastmasters to learn how to deliver substance, how to get support for our efforts at work or in other places in life. So I added this section to capture the items that most uh, indicate the quality of a speech's purpose or its effectiveness. And by the way, in case you were wondering, Craig took first place in that contest. And finally, only thing that I've missed is caught in the chart of basics. I got this from the workshop by Renee. I added a version of her chart to capture kind of just the fundamentals of delivery skills. Was the you know, energy level or tone appropriate for the speech? Was the speaker comfortable? Were they prepared? Were they clear? Were they aware of the audience and adapt to the audience, et cetera? I will gonna say, I will share this template later on, but I highly, so you, you don't need to jot this list down very quickly. I will encourage you all to create your own templates and evolve them as well. And now the last part, to find high bar, high bar feedback, you need to be able to evaluate both advanced and beginner speakers. Here, the first principle I use is to remember your job is not just to give compliments or just to find fault. Speakers at all levels need to know what they can improve on or try in the future. And they also need to know what they should keep doing or keep building on. So you are gonna need to be able to identify multiple positives and multiple improvements for any given speech. And, and I assure you, you can do this because you know what's possible. Measure speakers against the next level up. So if you're evaluating an advanced speaker, picture the professional speakers you've seen, stand-up comedians, TED Talk speakers. Compare the speaker to the polish and advanced skills of professionals. And doing that, you will always find multiple improvements. For example, you might suggest a sophisticated use of the stage that you saw in a comedy special. You might point out a more nuanced way to craft a story that you saw from a conference hall. And for the beginner speakers, measure them against like the next level Toastmaster. Give them improvements, but attainable ones that they can take. Maybe it's about how to take initial forays into vocal variety, how to deliver the first memorized speech, or how to better organize a speech. But I'm going to say, in all cases, measure the speaker against the next level up. Because keep in mind whether it is work presentations, reference talks, or job interviews, all of us are preparing for stages that are much bigger than and not as friendly as Toastmasters meetings. So picture the next level up of whoever you're evaluating and give them feedback to get them to that level. And lastly, for both advanced and beginner speakers, looking at details will help you find multiple positives and multiple improvements. In the case of advanced speakers, it's often it's tricky to find something to critique, but look at even the finest of errors. Subtle improvements are what advanced speakers want to know about. Uh, I'll give an example. I once told a speaker they needed to pause literally like half a second, maybe a second longer after their humorous moments. But the reason is timing is very critical to humor. And when a speaker doesn't give the audience enough time to react and laugh, it makes the speech sound kind of scripted or not genuine. But that level of scrutiny is what advanced speakers are looking for. Don't feel bad asking them to do these things. Now for beginners, looking at the details helps here too. In this case, you might find it very easy to find all of the improvements they need to make. 
But what positives can you find? But when you observe a speaker's speech closely, there will always be things you can find to admire. For example, almost everyone reveals something unique about themselves in little uh, choices about their content. Maybe it's the title of their speech. Did it set up the speech well? Uh, their chosen subject matter, the particular anecdotes, anecdotes they selected. When you look at these details, you may uncover an interesting choice that's worth pointing out. But regardless of the speaker level, details and subtleties will help you find those multiple positives and multiple improvements. So to summarize, to find high bar feedback, maintain loyalty to speaker progress by giving honest, accurate evaluations, even when the news is bad, use a template to capture all aspects of the speech, and lastly, be able to evaluate speakers of all skill levels by measuring them against the next level up and looking at the details. We have a little bit of bonus content here as well. When Dennis gave us feedback about our speech evaluators, one of the officers asked, who evaluates the evaluators? I think it was Deepak. I don't know, Christy, do you remember? I like to give credit, so I was trying to remember who said it. But I realized it's a good question and the answer, it's the general evaluator of our meetings. So I wanna remind everyone who takes the general evaluator role, remember to scrutinize not just how we run our meetings, but also look at the quality of our content. So include the content from the functionaries, their introductions, their reports, prepared speakers, the table topics master and the table topics answers, and of course the evaluators. I will make one note, do make sure you don't repeat the speech evaluations. It's if evaluators miss something, you can note it for the prepared speakers. And then of course, give feedback on the evaluations themselves. All right, how to. How to deliver constructive, efficient high bar evaluations. Because finding a whole mountain of great feedback is of no use if you can't deliver it effectively to a speaker and an audience. So I broke this into three sections as well. Note taking and preparation, speaking efficiently, and speaking constructively. So first for note taking presentation, a tip I got from Renee's workshop is to write down single words. She calls them golden nuggets. Uh, now, I confess I'm still working on this technique, so I allow myself short phrases because I am very, very guilty of nearly transcribing speeches. I have a bit of a bad listener problem, and transcribing ensures that I capture fine details. But the transcription also means that I don't have as much time to analyze the speech. I'm not watching the speaker. I'm not observing the audience, and I'm missing a lot of important details. So instead of transcribing, when you have one of those gut feelings, remember that? Just jot down a single word or phrase that can jog your memory. I'll give an example in a past speech by club member Rachel from, is like two phrases I wrote, unexpected equals lifelong. I might remember that Rachel's message was embracing life's unexpected moments can create lifelong memories. So secondly, with noting, you are going to need to trim down your choices. You'll only have two to three minutes for your evaluation, and it will not fit everything you observe, especially if you're a high bar evaluator. So pick the most critical, the most unique, the most useful tips for the speaker and the audience. To do this, you can ask yourself, what would I want most to know if this had been the speech? What would be most beneficial to audience members to hear? And time-wise, you'll be able to cover about three positives and two to three improvements. And besides, that's about the number of things someone can remember without taking notes. And finally, the sandwich outline is a very tried and true format. After you trim down your findings, you'll line your evaluation by leading with two examples of things the speaker did well. Follow that with your two to three improvements and end with an example of what they did best. And why this format is useful is that the two positives kind of warm up the speaker and the audience. Now with your listeners more receptive, you give them the, the protein of the sandwich, the critical feedback. And then you sandwich that protein with the best positive. And this ends your evaluation on an uplifting note and highlights one of the key things the user, the, I've been at work too long, not user, the speaker should keep doing. All right. Next, speaking efficiently. 
So the reason efficiency is important is because number one, you want to maximize the amount of time you spend on your observations and your suggestions. And two, concise content is easier to remember. It's not good for someone like me who has an editing problem, but it's very true. So uh, I'll note one thing. Personally, I do take notes every time I get a speech evaluation. I am also not a normal person. That said, I encourage you all to be abnormal with me. If you are a speaker getting an evaluation, I do think folks should take notes, but certainly do not expect the rest of the audience members to take notes. And that is why it's valuable to be concise and therefore memorable. And the first practice here is to avoid vague or unnecessary words and tropes. So some examples are, your speech drew me in, and closing with, I can't wait to hear your next speech, which I have said many times, that was nice to say, but phrases like that don't say anything new. They eat into your airtime. And for the same reasons, don't use vague or unnecessary words like real, great, amazing. If you find yourself saying vague or unnecessary content, then that's a sign that either you don't need the content or you need to be saying useful specifics instead. For an example, the speech is really amazing. It doesn't tell the speaker anything substantive, but saying something more specific, the speech is unexpected choices of anecdotes made it memorable. That tells the speaker what they should keep doing and it's working for them. Okay, secondly, another tip on efficiency, don't summarize. The audience just heard the same speech you did. The speaker knows their own speech. Summaries also eat up airtime and that, that should be dedicated to observations and suggestions. For example, uh, imagine this is the opening of an evaluation. In Roger's speech, he shared his travel experiences in Croatia where he ran into an unusual shop owner who at first seemed incredibly rude and unhelpful, but after several days navigating the city, it turns out, you can see I'm starting to re-deliver the speech. <laughs> so don't summarize. If you're, for example, I'd say in a speech contest and wanting to open with a little bit of color, you could say, Use an observation. Roger's speech and a shop owner's grumpy demeanor changed my perception of what helpfulness looks like. And finally, lastly, use that after meeting time. First of all, why are we even bothering with a spoken evaluation? It's because it's an opportunity for the audience to hear the key feedback too. Audience members learn from evaluation and say, well, it may reinforce what they're hearing, it may counter what they're hearing, and they learn either way. And for the speech evaluators, it's also a practice on processing and delivering an immediate analysis. So this does mean that an evaluation speech, it's a performance with a time limit. So there's only so much that you can fit in. However, do not let this limit uh, constrain your full feedback for the speaker. I'll say always, always, always meet with your speaker after the meeting to share your additional feedback, clarify, answer any questions, it's the time to share the stuff you had to trim out, as well as any feedback that maybe was hyper-specific to the speaker and less relevant to a general audience. And I'll say, of course, for a remote or hybrid setup, as, as Zen is doing today, please make sure to email the speaker in place of an after-meeting chat. All right, finally, speaking constructively. These are techniques for you to deliver critical feedback in ways that help others. The first practice is to use I statements. Your opinion is valid. It's what you're offering. And the speaker can always decide whether or not they want to act on what you say. But they should know how you felt or reacted. And using a I statement subconsciously sets this framing for all the listeners. So a few examples of this are, I heard, I felt, I noticed. Those are good for sharing things you observed. I liked, I enjoyed, are good for things that work well for you. I was confused by, I didn't understand, are good for sharing moments where the speech detracted for you. And for suggestions, I wanted to know, I like seeing, I like hearing, are good for putting forth things that you want to suggest the speaker try. All right, next, there is a debate on whether to use third person voice or second person voice when you deliver evaluation. I'll explain what they are really briefly. Third person voice is referring to the speaker by name. For example, you noticed Kat did not embrace the project goal of vocal variety. That is real feedback I got once. I, it was true. I was glad I heard it though. 
the second person voice is referring to the person as you, your, for example. Pat, I noticed that you didn't embrace the project goal. So some speakers who admire <clears throat> Dennis <clears throat> uh, swear by using second person voice. And there are some good reasons to do that, such as having more of a natural dialogue quality to the, to the evaluation. I will note, I currently use third person voice. I will share why. A second person voice can feel a little voyeuristic to listen to, which is an observation Craig once shared as a general evaluator of a meeting. Uh, because in the meeting, you're talking to the audience and making eye contact with the audience, not just the speaker. And it can kind of feel misaligned to say you when I'm looking at Kate, but I'm talking about Lucy, <laughs> for example. But now one good reason I could say you might want to like second person is that the speaker, it can feel too exposing to be spoken about when you're just sitting right there. Uh, some people feel it maybe has a passive aggressive element, but I'll note that on the other hand, second person voice can feel a little attacky and personal and raise defensive mechanisms against critique. I noticed one time, this one time when I had a debate on Facebook, I mean, I should know better. It's a bad idea to have debates on Facebook. <laughs> too many ways to miscommunicate. But I, I saw that the debate really went sideways the first moment I dropped the pronoun you. Other person took everything even more personally. So to avoid the voyeuristic quality of delivering the evaluation and the unconscious defensiveness that can happen, I use third person voice. This is the context I'll share. I leave the choice up to you. But one thing I know that's most important, whichever option you choose, just make sure to stick with it throughout the evaluation. Don't go back and forth. That creates an inconsistency for all your listeners. And finally, use specific examples and suggestions. So when you make an observation or suggestion, they're far more memorable, convincing, and actionable when they're accompanied by specifics. This is where your single words and short phrases come in handy, those, those golden nuggets. They should jog your memory and then you can flesh out your feedback with detailed specifics. For example, I might write down gestures and action. And instead of saying simply, the gestures are really great, something more useful and specific is, I noticed gestures delineated where the action in the story took place and made it easier for me to picture the events. Or instead of saying, I didn't like the gestures. <laughs> it's more useful to hear. I felt the speech had repetitive and unnecessary gestures because the speaker over punctuated too many moments. So to summarize, to deliver constructive, efficient high bar evaluations, practice concise note taking, deliver your edited down feedback in the sandwich outline format, Speak efficiently by avoiding unnecessary words and tropes. Don't summarize the speech and use that after meeting time. And speak constructively by using I statements, sticking with either third or second person voice throughout the speech and provide specific examples and suggestions. So, okay, we've talked a lot about technique here. Let's talk about why to invest in being a high bar evaluator. It turns out there's so many benefits of speech evaluations, both in and outside of Toastmasters. So first, you will get better listening skills. I experienced this most the year I got to the district contest, because the further you go, the more opportunities you get to practice this skill. And it's, it's really like a muscle you can exercise. And when you have better listening skills, you understand others around you better. In my experience, I cannot count so many times a work, romantic, or family relationship had a substantial conflict that was caused by an initial small misunderstanding. And with more people with good listening skills helps mitigate that. Secondly, you will improve your live analysis skills. I didn't, this is another one of those things before I joined Toastmasters, I didn't think it was a muscle you can work on, but it's another one of those. Um, after my contest run, I immediately spotted BS in a speaker's answer at an event. I mean, okay, I'll use constructive language. I noticed how the guest speaker didn't actually answer a question about the controversy at the company because it was wrapped up in a polished sounding response. And whether you are listening to a team meeting, company town hall, a press conference, you're, you will notice that you'll be able to use your ear that's been tuned to detect real content versus 
empty content. Thirdly, one of the other benefits you get is you'll be better at identifying what's important. Remember how you had to edit down your observations to just three positives and two to three improvements? That's a prioritization skill, a decision-making skill. And again, another speaking and leadership muscle that you can exercise. In, in our work and other relationships, we often decide what we want to tackle and bring up to other people. Because real life, kind of like a two to three minute evaluation also has limits on how much criticism a person, a certain person or relationship can take. And identifying what's most important will help you what's most important done. And finally, to the start of the workshop, giving feedback to peers, managers, reports, and relationships. Uh, first, I'll point out that many of the little techniques from today are useful anywhere in life. Using I statements can make a request or, or critique easier to receive. I will say using the sandwich technique really does work on people, but I'll, I'll quote, I'll note, keep it genuine on, on the bread of your sandwich. <laughs> the point is to be honest, not manipulative. And as for frequent and immediate feedback, some months ago, I noticed that when performance reviews come around, you know, maybe once or twice a year, depending where you work, it can be really difficult to tell a reporter, peer, or manager something critical when when I hadn't told them there'd been an issue for all that whole time. Uh, so what makes it easier is ensuring recurring moments for feedback. Whether you are a manager or not, I encourage you all to take the initiative and set an example. I told a report in one of our first meetings that I like to receive and give frequent feedback. We set up a notes document and I said, we should both put notes in here during the week whenever something comes up. And this made my port, right, report more comfortable to ask for something that we ended up changing. Now, a funny thing is, I have not had a manager do this setup with me until very recently. And I realized because my managers had never done it, I, was, I had been hesitant to do it. I would say one thing is like, I probably could have been proactive and done it myself. But I finally had a manager did. I'm so glad I did. I now not only get to enjoy the benefits of this frequent, immediate, and actual feedback, with people I've been responsible for, but I also get it with my manager as well now. Uh, it reminded me of like the fact that we have evaluation segments that are always in a Toastmasters meeting. So I encourage you all to find ways to build evaluation segments into your life as well. And that concludes the presentation portion of the workshop. I hope you all have some good notes and tips on how to find high bar feedback, how to deliver it in a constructive, efficient way. And I hope you are excited to reap the benefits of being high bar evaluated. But before I close, you might have noticed that I gave a lot of credits during the workshop. Use these guidelines, but remember, I didn't arrive at them on my own. I encourage you to observe other evaluators, spread advice, watch workshops, Always be updating your, your processes and your skills and basically keep raising that bar. Thank you.